Thank you for that. Man, I knew I forgot something. I posted the slides. I thought I was all good to go, forgot something. Okay, thank you. So the United States is booming. It's growing, everything's changing, things are new. Cities are growing. Massive waves of immigrants are, United, are arriving in the United States during the Gilded Age. During the Gilded Age, around 16 million immigrants are gonna show up for all sorts of reasons, right? Again, escaping poverty, uh, escaping religious persecution, looking for social mobility, all of those reasons we had already written down are the reasons why. What do you need from this slide? You need the numbers. You need to know that everything's growing. Everything's getting bigger and better. Most European immigrants, so when we talk about, you know, Irish, Eastern European, England, anywhere from Europe, for the most part, are arriving at the East Coast. And they are staying on the East Coast. And they're moving into cities like Chicago, Pittsburgh, and New York. Um, on the West Coast, the immigrants that show up are mostly Asian and primarily Chinese immigrants. Um, that's where most substantial numbers of Asian immigrants are coming from. They're going into the West Coast and they're mostly Chinese. And that's also a lot of political instability in China and things like that. So I'll give you about a minute and a half. You need to mark that the Chinese immigrants are going West and a lot of the European immigrants are going East. And that the, you might, and no, not might, it's a good idea to name the cities. So name the cities. Know that that's where a lot of these immigrants are going to show up in. Why do you think it's significant that immigrants are showing up in major cities? What is that going to do in those cities? Economic boost? Sure. What else? There's a growing workforce. I'll give you that. What else? Think about the city itself. Maybe the people living in it. What what could change in the city? Diversify culture. Yes, that's really solid. And that's a big part of what some of the next couple of slides are going to be about as far as how immigrants reacted. Um, I think that's in key point three. But yes, diversify culture is another big one. Anything we missed? Anything else? Can anybody think of anything else? So the economy is going to boost. Culture is going to change. What's going to happen to the city? Anybody? About 30 seconds left on the clock, by the way. It's going to grow, right? Awesome. So because the city is going to grow, you're going to have this huge wave of cities growing everywhere, right? It's why the three cities up here are still really big cities. Now, Pittsburgh, not as much. You know, Steel's not as big of a deal anymore. But it's why they're still considered large cities. It's why they all have football teams. OK. So let's move forward. Anybody need more time? Uh, I would say grab a screenshot. I'll give you a few more seconds for that. And then we're gonna move forward into urbanization, right? And urbanization, as you know, is cities growing. Okay. So the developments of urban zones, cities changed and grew during this era. That should say era into massive urban spaces. Um, prior to the Civil War, all the different classes in society lived in the same city. They lived in the urban center. They lived in the middle of town. They all lived near each other. They like, so Farmer Joe or factory worker Phil might live right next to railroad owner Paul, right? And they all live in the same street. They all live in the same area prior to the Civil War. But after the Civil War, the middle and upper classes, and again, the middle class is barely there, but it's still a thing kind of, and the upper classes especially will move out of the cities and away from the urban center. That's where suburbs come into place, right? You guys know what suburb is, right? Like a little, like a little neighborhood outside of the town. So that's where suburban centers come from. So the wealthier classes will move out of the city centers and away from them um, to get away from the rapidly growing city uh, working class districts become spots where the underpaid working class lived only. And a lot of them are going to be built up with tenement structures, right? Tenements are really quickly built and they're really badly built. Um, they have poor ventilation, poor construction, and diseases spread throughout these areas, like everywhere. Uh, cholera, typhus, tuberculosis, dysentery, all sorts of stuff just festers and grows in these urban uh, working class districts. And it's, it's really gross and it's really unsafe and it's, uh, it's dirty. It stays that way for a long time. 
So this is how urban zones will develop during the Gilded Age, right? That's why it's gilded. It's nice on the outside, but the further in you look, the, the rougher it kind of gets. That's so the so that's a good question. Like, is there like, yes, there is, but depends on how far back you want to go, right? So there is and there isn't. Part of what this arrow will show is that there needs to be people to clean up the street so that stuff isn't there. So like the earlier in the Gilded Era, yes. But later on, like, I don't know if you guys remember an exit ticket like a week ago, I had like that picture from the New York like sanitation, it's people cleaning the streets. The reason that's a thing, and that was like a star question, that was an easy question. Uh, that's there because urbanization is growing, right? So what might have been okay, like, and the question is like throwing uh, feces out on the streets. What might have been okay when not a lot of people live in the city is definitely, one, it's not okay in general, right? But it's definitely not going to be okay when the city's as full as they get, which is why things like sanitation and plumbing and street cleanings and all that becomes a thing. Unless you live in San Francisco, but that's another story. Um, about another minute on here. And we're going to move uh, forward. So if you need more time than that, let me know. But what do you need here? Again, cities are growing. Point out tenements. I know we've talked about them once already, but you got to point them out again, as, especially the disease aspects. I know we didn't spend a lot of time on that. And then point out that separation. The upper classes are leaving the city centers, the working class districts, but the working class have to stay there. It's the only place they can afford. You know, they're not building giant mansions like Vanderbilt is. I just realized Vanderbilt's last name is said built in it. And he built railroads. <laughs> I didn't. About one minute left. <laughs> These are the kind of humor you can find at my YouTube channel, guys. Uh, now, now uh, tentatively sponsored by Audible. If I keep saying it, it has to happen, right? If I just keep saying they're sponsors, eventually they'll be like, well, we should sponsor. That's how that works. Pretty sure. Pretty sure that's how that works. May or may not know nothing about digital advertisement. Free money. <laughs> yeah, it's free money, right? Eventually they'll just be like, here you go. It's for, for back pay for all the sponsors you did. You sponsored by Audible? No, I'm not actually sponsored by Audible. You can try to get a sponsorship from <laughs> Yeah, I don't know if they, they go into that game. I feel like they don't. I feel like they don't need to sponsor anybody. They're a major restaurant. About 20 more seconds. If you need a screenshot, please grab it so we can move on. Just email them like 500 times, maybe. That might also get you blocked, though. <coughs> Sorry, I almost died. All right. <clears throat> They'll eventually answer, maybe. <coughs> OK, so. Let's go to move forward. Migration. Now we're talking about migration. Now, before anybody writes anything down, before anybody writes anything down, let's say it one more time. We're going to talk about a very specific migration movement that happened. But why else were regular Americans all over the U.S. during the Gilded Age and even now during the Gilded Age migrate? And where were they migrating to? Somebody in the chat put it, or put it in the chat, I should say. Where are they migrating to and why are they migrating? Why is the average American who's going to migrate, why do they migrate and where do they go? Jobs, urban centers, good, what else? North for freedom, this is Gilded Age, so post-Civil War, so not quite. Why else? So jobs in urban centers, so they're moving to cities for jobs, what else? Money opportunities in cities, sure, what else? West, they're moving out west for other economic opportunities, right? What are they trying to build out west? Remember that act in 1862? These people, they have a name, they go out, they build little farms, they get 160 acre plots. We remember that name, remember that act, it's important. I'll give you a second, homesteads, right? So they're homesteaders and homestead acts. So that's another form of migration. Now, that being said, we're going to talk about the exoduster movement. Sounds kind of cool, right? Sounds like a sci-fi movie. The exoduster movement was a massive movement of African-Americans from the South to the West. So that's what it was. That's the exoduster movement. So you got to define it. 
and there's reasons for it. So I'm going to give you about a minute to define it. And then I'm going to start getting into the reasons because I want you to hear some of these because actually I'm going to only give you 30 seconds to define it and then I'll get into it and then I'll give you a minute to fill it in and then we'll talk about what happens. So about 30 seconds, define exodestrian movement. It's important. You're going to need it. <clears throat> and that is, a, I believe, a photo of exodestrian uh, homesteaders that chose to homestead instead of uh, doing what other groups did. So the exodestrian movement comes out of this place, this need, this uh, not even want, but this necessity for something different. Because out in South, post-Reconstruction, right, the Jim Crow era is starting to take hold. Jim Crow laws. Uh, unfair treatments, disenfranchisement, all these bad things that come with Jim Crow. On top of that, you have harassment and violence from terror groups like the Ku Klux Klan and African-Americans want to leave the South. So they want to migrate to places like Kansas. Kansas is where most went. They also went to Oklahoma and Colorado. Around 40,000 African-Americans from the South migrated during this movement. And there were groups like the Colored Relief Board of Kansas and um, the Kansas Freedmen's Aid. Those are the two names, Colored Relief Board, Kansas Freedmen's Aid, were built and designed to help these people migrate. Because as you can see here, you can do so for $5. Maybe some of them didn't have $5, especially during Jim Crow era in the South. So it's ways to help them migrate out. So that's what it is. That's why it happened. You need to know why, because of Jim Crow, because of terror groups. You need to know how many, 40,000, right? And then mention those groups, those groups about the Colored uh, Relief Board and the Kansas Freedmen's Aid, they're really helpful. They're, you just got to know the names, right? These are groups that were built to help these people migrate. Uh, most exodusters that were successful did so because they went into urban centers. Maybe they got jobs as uh, workers, um, servants, or factory workers, things like that. But they got jobs in the urban centers. Some sought out to create homesteads with whatever land was left in Kansas, because Kansas is not as far west as some of the other places, right? The problem with a lot of these homesteaders is that most of the really, really, really good land in the area was given away to railroad companies, right? Because remember, the government loves giving land to railroad companies. It's kind of like one of their favorite things to do during the era. So with what was left, it was really hard to make a living on a homestead. So the vast majority of these homesteaders during the exodusters movement will end up being unsuccessful and stuck in a debt cycle, uh, financial turmoil and all of that bad stuff. So most of that went to go seek homesteads, failed. Most of them did. Some of them succeeded, but most failed. And most of the, and pretty much all of the ones that were successful went into urban centers. So that's the difference between the outcomes of what happened during the movement. So we do need that uh, written in there. So I'll give you about two and a half minutes because there is a lot of info on this slide. It is all pretty important. What I just realized is I only didn't record the key points. So what I'm gonna do when I'm done is go really back to the front and say, hey, key point one and two are at the or at the end. I'm gonna put it in the title, key point one and two are at the end. So it's gonna get a little weird when I record the read the, the uh, first two key points again for a couple of seconds. That's a fair warning. I'm about a minute and 15 seconds left. So if you need more time than that, let me know. About a minute and change left. Make sure you got the exo duster movement. Again, think think sci-fi movie. That's what I always think of when I think of the, the exo duster movement, because it's just such a weird sounds like a like a duster coat that's got armor in it or something. I don't know. But exo duster movement. And I have no idea why it was called that, by the way. It's not relevant to AP, so I wouldn't even bother like figuring that out. It's not a, it's not a, that's what it was called though.
after about 30 seconds, we're going to move on to the last key point. So if you need more time than that, let me know. All right, we're gonna move forward. So key point three, urban neighborhoods based on particular ethnicities, races, and classes provided new cultural opportunities for city uh, dwellers. So like we said earlier, right, with all these immigrants going into these cities, the culture is gonna change. It is going to change in a big, bad way. Um, we've talked about stuff like barbecue or spaghetti or like whatever being, influenced by immigrants, but it's more than just food. You'll see businesses, churches, um, political groups, banks, all sorts of things that are going to be designed around these immigrants and their culture. Um, things like Chinatown, Little Italy, um, and then there's even more that we will get into. I'll give you about a minute and a half on here, then we'll move on. <coughs> About a minute left. Make sure you have the key point down and we're gonna move on. Thirty seconds. Make sure you have this key point down. If you need a screenshot, grab it, and we're going to move on. You're almost done with notes, guys. Almost done. Not quite done yet, but close. All right, we're gonna go to move forward. So the way this diversity shows itself is in something called ethnic enclaves, right? And what ethnic enclaves are, are basically just like groups, neighborhoods um, of different immigrant groups gathering together, right? Different ethnicities coming together in the same area. So that's where you get like Little Italy or Chinatown, right? Cause it's all from a certain immigrant group and they're all gathering in the same areas. Um, what the next bullet point is a list of examples of what happened and synagogues might be horribly misspelled because I'm bad with Hebrew. So if it is, I apologize. Um, but Irish Catholic churches, Jewish synagogues, banks where deposits could be made with their own money that were all immigrant owned political groups, grocery stores. That's something I want to point at, point at, point out, because that's something that you will notice today. These two specific uh, food marts are from San Antonio. And the one I go to, I've been to one that was, I think it's just called Asian Grocery. I don't even know where it is. Uh, and I couldn't find a picture of it. But um, my point is that these little signs of immigration and immigrant owned businesses and things like that are still very handy. Do you guys like, have you guys ever been to like an Asian grocery store or a European grocery store, an Indian grocery store? Like, I don't know if any of y'all cook a lot, but like. There are certain types of ingredients or tools or things that you need for certain types of cooking that you can only get at those stores. Like, what's an example? Like Chinese Five Spice, the really good ones, you can only find them at Asian grocery stores or Asian restaurant supply stores. Um, you guys know what a spider walk is? Um, or a spider strainer, I think is what they're called. I think they're just called spiders. It's like this little wooden thing. Um, you can always like, you can buy these for like 20 bucks on Amazon, probably 10 bucks. But if you go to like an Asian supply store, you can get a really good one. That's with the wood handle for like $3. And that's where I always buy mine. 
Um, and then I always just give them to people that are like, oh my God, that's so convenient. Gordon Ramsay uses, yeah, anybody who knows what they're doing and they're cooking things and they're straining, they use those. Those are way better. Like they're awesome. They're so, what do you use them for? You can use them for all sorts of stuff. You can take hot things out of, basically it's for taking stuff that's hot out of liquid. So you can use them for pasta, you can use them for noodles, you can use them for like frying. Like I use them for when I fry stuff. You take like like French fries, anything you're, you're in a deep fry, I use them for that. They're the best. And they're, they work better than any gadget, gizmo or anything. And don't buy these, they suck. Like you need the wooden handle. The, you, the, I almost ruined my, my a pod and a stove because that plastic handle melted everywhere. Dark magic cooking tool. It's not dark magic, that's the thing. It's a really simple tool and again, like that's something that I found because I was wandering around in an Asian grocery store. Tis sorcery. Um, but my point is that those are all things that happen because of immigration, right? You want something to be like home. Like for when, I, when I've when i lived outside of, so what I like about San Antonio, because I've lived in a few places, is that there's still a lot of Hispanics in San Antonio. So it's easy for me to get things that remind me of what home tastes like when I lived in College Station or when I lived in DC or when I've lived in other places, I miss like fajitas, like really good fajitas. I miss that stuff. You can't find it in other places. You have to go through so many hoops to get fajitas in a state like Missouri. Like I had a buddy that got married in Missouri and we we're cooking and he wanted fajitas. And I'm like, I'll get you some. But I had to literally like go to a butcher and I had to put it in like regular terms. I need a skirt steak. I need it split in half, butterfly trimmed, and then I need it trimmed to fat. And like, you have to make all these steps and it costs way more than it should have. And it's like a pain to do. But in play, if, if in that little Missouri town, there had been a large group of Hispanics that had migrated or immigrated there, I probably could have gone to a meat market that was Hispanic owned, right? And just said, I want fajitas. And they would have been like, here you go, right? They didn't, fajitas are fajitas. Well, fajitas are skirt steak. But my point is, my point is that th that's all because of immigration and migration, right? And all these little culture pockets. So what makes America really awesome? And I encourage you guys, and this is where I'm going to rant a little bit, right? Like, get the info. This is important. This is all starting in the Gilded Age. But I would recommend, like, if you guys do like Chinese food, Asian food, anything like that, I would recommend you check out some of these stores. You'll find cool things. You'll find ingredients for stuff that you can make at home that you would never know. And um, a lot of the best types of that stuff you can only find in these really, they're like almost like specialty stores, but they're just little grocery stores. You would never think about it driving by it. And again, those are two from San Antonio that I don't think I've been to either one, but, but the point is that they're, they're all over the place. Um, and you find them everywhere. And a lot of different things are there. And HEBs have a lot of the stuff, but like the HEB stuff is never as good as the stuff that they bring. Cause a lot of their stuff's imported. Like tomato paste. Italian tomato paste is the best tomato paste. It's the best, it's the best. It's just better than all the other ones. But anyways, I am ranting and rambling about food products. But my point is all that comes from immigration. It all comes from the Guild Age. So I'll give you about a minute and change to get the info down because I was rambling about fajitas and about spider walks. And then we'll move on. And I will, I'm going to take a minute of your all's time to just show the other key points on the video and give people time to pause it. So bear with me on that as well. About a minute left. And these are just some of the examples of immigration you see, like the grocery stores. What else is super obvious that like, if there's a large group of immigrants in an area, you will probably see other than like rest, uh, um, grocery stores or the neighborhoods. Like if you drive through little Germany or, you know, what, else, what do they call it, New Braunfels? What else do you see that's like super German that is specific to Germany? Like what other things might you see that are just there because there's a lot of Germans in New Braunfels? If you don't know, you put not really sure. And I'll just right. So food items, right? Like restaurants. You'll see like like beer gardens. You'll see like um, pretzel shops, things like that. German name buildings, bunch of shapers. Yeah, you'll see a bunch of shapers walking around. You'll see all that stuff, right? But that's all because of that immigration thing. German name buildings is a really good one. In some places, you'll see like the. Um, like you see this in a lot of like California and Southwest places, a lot of the infrastructure will look like Spaniards versus English people in the East. A bunch of shapes, that's funny. But all right, that's time. So here's what I'm gonna do guys, bear with me. All I'm gonna do, and those of you that are watching the video of this later, 
I started this late. So I'm going to give you five seconds on key point one, pause this and write it down. Five seconds on immigrant or migrant, pause this and write it down. These are just straight up definitions. You don't need to do much to it. Just make sure you know the difference between the two. And five seconds on key point two, pause this, write it in because I'm lying. I'm already going to move on. So just pause it, move on. Don't forget the immigrants. Well, we had that one already, right? I started recording on this slide instead of migrants. Yeah, I said that, right? So immigrants, migrants, not the same thing. Oh, yes. If you see migrants on here, change it to immigrants. Thank you, Janessa. I didn't know. I forgot that. On key point two, change migrant to immigrant. And that is it for this recording. And now we're going to move on. Okay, guys. So exit ticket time. With Japanese, yes. Well, uh, the one here, I believe that is an attraction. Um, but it is still an attraction that is brought up from that, right? Because if there were no, the influence is still the immigration, right? Because that grocery store, there's, I don't think there's a little Japan in San Antonio, but that Japanese grocery store, I'm not kidding, is a, is a picture. I found like a, like a My San Antonio article and just took pictures from it. That's in San Antonio. So those are all still things. So it is an attraction, but I would say it is it is still influenced in that sense. So yeah, I would actually say yes. I was gonna say no, but no, I think I think it would be in the same way that this grocery store is. There's, I mean, look at the building. There's a giant Texas star on the front of it, but it's still a Japanese grocery store, right? It's still the immigration showing itself. It doesn't have to be like, this is an attraction in New York City, Little Italy, you know, you can practically hear the Godfather soundtrack playing in the background when you walk through it. That's not necessarily everywhere. That doesn't mean that you can't feel the immigration, uh, what would you say, like the, the influence. Okay, so with that being said, let's head into Google Classroom. Uh, your exit ticket is something I want you to take a little bit more uh, care on. It is not as straightforward as the other one. The first two are identify and explain factors that lead to immigration. Tell me why immigrants are showing up. Identify and explain factors that lead to migration. Tell me why migrants are moving. Those are straightforward questions. The third one, I want you to really, really sit there. Use the time I'm going to give you because I'm going to give you plenty of time. And predict how the United States, the people in the United States, the non-immigrants, the not migrants, are going to react to both of these things. Because we're going to talk about that on Tuesday when we come back. How are the people in the United States going to react? I'm not even going to give you any hints because it's all stuff you should probably already know about. We've talked about some of this already. How are people going to react? Be specific in all of your responses, name events, name things. For one, for two, for three, I get it if you don't name events, but you should be able to name trends and movements that are going to happen. Tell me what you think is going to happen. It is 310. I'm going to give you 10 minutes. I want you to fill in the exit ticket. So you got 10 minutes on the clock. That's a really good uh, piece, uh, Janessa. I would put that in, I would use some of that info. Yes, you're in the right track for sure. So about 10 minutes on the clock. And then there will be about five minutes left in the class and you can have that time as a Friday gift from me, but make sure that you do this exit ticket, do not leave this call. Stay on here, finish the exit ticket so that way you don't have to do anything later. You don't forget about it. This is due today. Uh, projects are not due till Tuesday. Tuesday, Tuesday. I don't know what I was saying there. It's spelled Tuesday wrong. But make sure that you have those done as well. I will try to get into Teams on Monday on MLK Day and just kind of post the thing about the project. Do we still turn in? No, so the notes are not due till Tuesday. I'm going to fix that right now. I'm actually going to do that right now in Google Classroom. I'm going to fix that. The notes are not due till Tuesday. Said I was going to fix it before, and I didn't. So I'm going to fix it right now somewhere. Here it is. There we go. Got it. Okay. So that is done. So the notes are not due till Tuesday. The project is due on Tuesday. Um, Max, that's really good. Yes, it could be that. Make sure that's in full like response format, but yes, that's good info. 
a good prediction. But yes, so keep that in mind moving forward. Project is due Tuesday. You Notes know, will be due at the end of class on Tuesday, but we're not going to have time in class. We're going to be talking about uh, reactions to all this immigration and migration. And um, I was saying, and I'm going to try to do this, and I'm going to stop speaking after this so you guys can focus. Um, probably on Monday, I will try to post a reminder, hey, Project Food tomorrow um, on Teams. I'll just make a little post on it, just so that way you guys don't forget, in case, but try to finish them before. Eight minutes. <laughs> 